Herkese merhabalar, hoş geldiniz. Ee, bugün aramızda Peter var, Peter bizimle. Ee, daha önceki webinar serilerimizi ya da Meetup serilerimizi takip edenleriniz eminim aranızda olmuştur. Ee, düzenli hale getirmeye çalışıyoruz demiştik. Ee, bu da aslında e, bir devam serisi olarak devamı olacak Meetup serisinin. Ee, bu hafta konumuz Power BI olacak. Power BI'da bildiğiniz gibi Power Platform aslında Power Apps, Power BI ve Power Automate gibi farklı bileşenleri var. Bugünkü odağımız Power BI ve onun üzerinde de Veri modelleme, data modeling ve relationship konulu olacak. Ee, öncelikle ben e, Peter'a teşekkür ediyorum. Thank you for your time and coming to Turkey and come, e, being with us. Ee, sözü çok uzatmadan ben Peter'a devredeyim. Ee, soru cevap kısımlarında zaten interaktif bir şekilde ilerliyor oluruz. Ee, yaklaşık bir saat sonra bir ara vereceğiz. Sonrasında tekrar devam ediyor olacağız. Sorularınız olursa aralarda da zaten konuşuyor oluruz. Teşekkürler. Okay, well thank you very much, good evening and welcome. Tonight's presentation is on Power BI model relationship. And more precisely, it is what you should do and perhaps what you should not do when it comes to developing model relationships. So welcome, my name is Peter Myers. I come all the way from Melbourne, Australia, Istanbul for the week. It's been 10 years since I last was at Istanbul and I said, next time I come, Hemisphere, I will come. So here I am, and I very much appreciate the efforts of putting together a presentation this evening. The rest you will learn more about me later, but I want to know a little bit more about you. So could you help me by using the QR code, or you can enter the URL. You will be presented with some brief questions when you submit your responses real time. We will see the results here in a Power BI dashboard. Please take one minute to submit your responses. We also have people. Almost 20 people. So, okay. I can see in the room here maybe 20, 30 people. I want to see this dashboard grow to at least 40 missions. Okay, we have one in. Thank you. My Turkish isn't very good, so the survey is in English. Real-time dashboards in Power BI is one of my favorite topics, but this will be a presentation for eight. Ah, what do we do? Welcome, somebody here has zero experience in Power BI. Right room. I doubt so. <laughs> That's what I ask myself. Are you, are you the zero? Yeah, I'm the zero. Okay. I'm not the only one, by the way. Now there are, now there are five. And this is perfectly okay, so welcome to those people that are, are new to Power BI. Tonight's presentation, however, is, is somewhat more advanced. I will do my very best for those people that have zero background to make it as understandable as possible. Okay, 28 submissions. I think I was looking for at least 40. Do you think we can make that number? 32, we're getting there. Is anyone working with real-time dashboards in Power BI? Okay, there's one. They are quite specialized, but they're very powerful in, in operational situations. 34. All right, as these results are coming in, I'm less interested in gender and age group. I am interested to know about what your role is here. Um, why do you use Power BI? So BI developers, being the biggest group of 10 people, um, really looking for, what have we got? Two analysts, 
maybe BI developers. I'm looking for data modelers. Tonight's topic about relationships is about developing models, models that are efficient and useful. Okay, so I'm really talking to these groups here. <coughs> for the rest of you, you are more than welcome to continue listening. So what else do we know? Okay, the Power BI experience itself. So uh, the biggest grouping is in fact, six people that have no background in Power BI. Okay, so tonight's presentation is very specialized. Just understand that this goes quite deep. Uh, we also have somebody that's a 10, and I won't ask for a volunteer, but if you're a 10, you can come up and do the presentation, and I will sit down and have a rest. <laughs> so totally fine. If I ask you the question, what is the average experience tonight? What would you answer? Four? Lower or higher? Is that an exact answer or is it a guess? Guess. Okay. Now, in business today, do we want our people in our organization to guess? We want them to estimate or would we prefer to give them up-to-date quality data that directly answers the questions they have? Which one? Do you want them to guess or do you want to give them good data and good presentation of data? Okay, of course. So this is an example of my question. What is the average experience tonight? This visual does not answer that question. Okay. So we could fix that by just using this great feature of Q&A. Let's use a natural language in English. Sorry, Turkish is not supported. But I could say, what is the average Power BI experience? Without guessing, what I would find is that the exact answer is, whoever said four is very good, is 3.73. And if I recognize that that is a question that will be asked again and again and again, well, I will pin that to my dashboard. And that way we can monitor that exact response. And there it is. We know the average is 3.73. Now, there was one other question that I asked you and it was to do with what is important for you tonight. Okay, so what is the most important topic for people is many to many relationships. Uh, romantic relationships came in next at nine people and I'm sorry to disappoint you. Maybe in the room next door, they might be talking about this, but tonight I will not, I was just tricking you. Um, one to many relationships and many to one relationships are the same thing. We'll learn this tonight. They are the most common type of relationship, so we most certainly talk about them. When it comes to one to one relationships, we will talk about them, but these are less interesting. And then I see that people want to know about strong relationships, yet nobody wants to know about weak. You will learn tonight about what these types of relationships are and what they mean for your mind. Okay, thank you for participating in the survey. We can now commence tonight's presentation. There are really only two topics. What are Power BI model relationships? And I will tell you everything that I think you need to know about them. And then what are the good practices we want you to adopt? We will tell you what the bad ones are, but we don't want you to adopt those. So let me begin with the first demonstration of a bad model. Why might this be a bad model? Because we had a due date column, order date and ship date. That's not necessarily bad. How many tables are there? No modeling? Technically there is modeling, but it's a very, very simplistic design. How many tables? Three? Four? Nope. There is in fact only one table sale extract 
all of these are fields from the one table. Okay, so let me switch across to the model design. And we see that this is a model consisting of one table, therefore there are no relationships between tables. This is not uncommon because maybe your data source is a flat file. And Power BI Desktop lets you very easily import data from the flat file. All columns become columns of a single table in your model. But we do not recommend this because when you look at the fields, you will see that some of the fields are related to products. We've got uh, names in here that are not related to products. And we have measures like quantity and measures like sale price. Everything is mixed together. So the first problem is, if you give somebody a big list of fields in a table, it's very difficult to understand. The second thing is, it may not be efficient especially as the data volumes grow to become large. And next, if you need to build calculations, you're making your life more difficult when all columns belong to a single table. Okay, so here is an example of a bad practice. Unless it's simple data discovery and exploration, don't do this. If you intend for this model to be published, to have a long life and for other people to connect to the model and build their reports, then you want to build a much more intuitive and friendly model and one that performs better, one that allows you to create efficient calculation. So that is my beginning demonstration. I take this demonstration no further. We do not recommend that you create single table models. All right, are we ready then to talk about the topic of Power BI relationships? Uh, and let me let you know, if you have questions during my presentation and they're really urgent, <coughs> hands up. We have a microphone here. If we need translator assistance, we can provide that as well. Otherwise, at the end of the session, if you have questions, you can ask them then. We will be taking a 15 minute break at around 6.30, 15 minutes. You can also ask me questions then. Does everybody understand and agree? Let us begin then. Model relationships propagate filter context to other model tables. When your model consists of more than one table, then you need to consider how relationships will work. Let's begin with an example. Very simple sales table. We have a product ID, we have a year, we have a quantity, and we have a product table, and there is a relationship from the product table to the sales table. Now what this means is, if somebody asks the question, what is the sales quantity of product B? We put a filter on the product table, and I want you to look at how product Two, filter propagates to the sales table. There are three rows for product two, and the total quantity is 17. This is what a relationship does. Filters applied to a table will propagate to other tables. Let's make this a little more interesting. There are three tables now. Category has a relationship to product, and product has a relationship to sales. And the question is, what is the quantity for category A? We filter category A. Power BI propagates the filter to products, to sales. This time, the quantity is 14. One more example. Let's add one more table, year. If our question is, what is the sales quantity of category A in? Year 2018, we have the same propagation and year to reveal that there is only one row in the sale table filtered. So the answer now is 11. This is exactly what happens when Power BI queries your models, applies filters, and those filters propagate to other tables. All right, so a good <coughs> model design 
should strive to deliver the right number of tables with the right relationship. Now, this is a tricky conversation. What is the right number of tables and what are the right relationships? And there is no one answer. I see that modeling is sometimes science and sometimes art. And you balance to come to the best arrangement. Sometimes more tables, fewer tables, it just depends on many things. But what I want to introduce to you is the topic of star schema time. Who here knows what star schema time means? Two or three, four or five people. And the reason that some people know is because I guess they come from a data warehouse background. That if you build a data warehouse and a relational data warehouse, a mature design approach is star schema. It is not the only approach, but star schema is so important to Power BI that I'm going to give you the basic just now. All right, so this, of course, is a star. Why is it called star schema? Because in the middle of the star is what we call a fact table. And a fact table, in simplistic definition, stores your business activity the sales orders. It is the accumulation of your sales activity. Now, the points of the star are what we call dimension tables, like product, date, our resellers, our employees, and our sales territory. If you use your imagination, then you can see that the dimension tables are the points. A little bit more detail is needed. These dimension tables are there to define your business entity. These are the things that you are modeling. They can be people, they can be products, they can be places. Even time and dates are the things that you model by. They must include a column that is a unique identifier. Values in that column cannot contain duplicates. And why they are important is that these tables are used for filtering and grouping. I want to filter by year 2018. I want to group by country. You must have these types of tables to support filtering and grouping. Fact tables, remember the center of the star, they store data like observations or events, like sales orders, stock movements, temperature observations, currency exchange rate. They will include the dimension column and they will include num values that you will summarize. Their purpose in Power BI is summarization. Right? So there's three things that happen at query time. We filter, we group, and we summarize the data in the model. Every visual on a report page is understand that. Filter, <coughs> group, summarize. Dimension tables are for filtering and grouping. Fact tables are for summarization of business activity. This slide here goes into much more detail and the presentation is available for you to download. All of these slides are a PDF that you can download at the end. But to make this super clear, we want tables in our model that behave like dimension tables. They're our thing. And then we want fact tables that will represent our business activity. Which type of table is likely to have the greatest number of rows? Fact tables, exactly. We might have 100, 500 products, but I hope that your business is successful, but you might have tens of thousands of sales orders. And your fact tables continue to grow every day larger and larger and larger. We like to have a lot of history because in business intelligence, we love to see trend over time. 2010 to 11, we want that history in fact. Okay, so let's move into Power BI models and the tables. In the Thank you. 
processes. Yes, so I will address that during the presentation. <coughs> and, uh, and the answer is that you will have multiple dimension tables that share relationships to them. You apply dimension filters, they can propagate at the same time to the two factors. See that for now. Okay, so Power BI tables. In Power BI desktop, where we develop models, the table is an object. In fact, it is the top level object for your model. There are five main objects, help me. Tables is one type of object in the model. What's another object? A hierarchy, yes. Before we get to hierarchies, tables have what? Columns. Tables and columns are the two most important objects that you are going to configure. Hierarchies and levels of hierarchies provide navigation. <laughs> And then the last object that allows us to define summarization? Measures. Measures. Measures, all right. So tables, columns, hierarchies, levels, measures, and yes, relationships bring the tables together. These are the core concepts for modeling. So with a focus on the table, the table has a property that is its name. The <coughs> name of the table must be unique in your model. It also has a storage mode. Is the storage import, is it direct query, which means when Power BI queries the table, it queries the underlying database, or is it both at the same time? The Power BI will import the data into the table, but sometimes when the table is queried, it will go to the relational database to get the data. We will come to this topic later. This matters if you develop what is composite model. Some tables are import, some tables are direct query, and others are both. And then there's the property that says what role is the table? Is it a dimension table or is it a fact table? And I'm lying. There is no property that says that your table is a dimension table or that your table fact table. Let's learn. If we introduce relationships then, relationships have lots of properties like cardinality, filter direction. Is it active? Will it assume referential integrity? The purpose of the relationship is to propagate filters from one table to another table and possibly back again. Understand that relationships are from one column, this is important, from one column in a table to one column in a different table. It is not possible to have a relationship to the same table. Okay, so from one column in one table to one column in a different table. We're going to learn about all of these properties tonight. Cardinality has four options. Is it one to many? Is it many to one? Is it one-to-one -one or is it many-to-many? -many? In fact, it is this cardinality that determines whether your table is a dimension table or a fact table. I will describe this in one minute. It is the cardinality that will determine this. All right, why is this the case? Look at this pattern. From fact to dimensions, they are many-to-one. The one side is always the dimension side. The tables that define your thing, dates, people, places, products, must have a single column that contains unique value. In the fact table, you will have the same column, but it will contain duplicate. This is the many side of your relationship. Okay, so many to one is in fact the most common relationship that you will use. Some more theory. Relationships are, ev relationships are evaluated at query time. They are either strong relationships or they are weak relationships. Okay? This is not a property that you can figure. It depends on the characteristics. So let me tell you this, that 
strong relationship means that Power BI understands that there is a one side to the relationship. So, one to many relationships, many to one relationships, and one to one relationships are all strong unless, unless it is relating the table in a composite model, that a direct query table is relating to an instance or a direct query table is relating to a direct query table from a different data set. Relationship will be weak. Okay, so for now, just understand this. Strong relationship means in an import data model, we're importing the data into the model, the most common model type. Every one-to-many relationship, every many-to-one relationship, and every one-to-one -one relationship is strong. All right, let's have a look at what this actually means. Here are three tables that are related, category, product, and sale. Notice the one-to-many and the one-to-many. They all belong to an import model, so they are all strong relationships. Now, what happens is that during query time, Power BI will do what is known as table expansion. What it does is it builds a single table in memory that allows it to understand how the relationship Right? So this makes perfect sense until what would happen if we add a new row to the sales table? And I want you to understand that product nine does not exist in the product table. Okay? So we have an integrity issue. We have sold a product, number nine, that has not been defined in the dimension table. And this is what happens in table expansion, is that for the category and product columns, they have blanks. And if you want to understand why sometimes in your Power BI report, the slicer has a blank option, do you see this sometimes? That blank option in the slicer and of course, the slicer is based on a dimension table, is telling you that the blank represents the data integrity problems in your many site. Okay, so table expansion is an important concept to understand. And in strong relationship, you will see blanks telling you data integrity problems. In weak relationship, you do not see the blank. So weak relationships are always many-to-many -many relationships, where the cardinality is many-to-many. -many. Or you have a composite model. Look at this. This model has vertipack tables. These are import tables. And it uses a direct query source in the same model. And look at the relationships between tables. Where are the strong relationships here? Can anybody tell me? The first one that I'm pointing at here. Is that a strong relationship? It's many to many. No, many to many is always weak. What about this one to many here? Yes, it is strong. All right. In the direct query source, we have a one to many. Is it strong or weak? is strong, okay? And then if we see the one-to-many here between the direct query and the import data, it is weak, okay? So let's be clear on this. These two are strong because they are one-to-many relationships inside their store. Many-to-many -many is always weak, and cross-relationships are always weak as well. All right, so it's important to understand this in composite modeling. For import modeling, the only time you will have weak relationships is many-to-many cardinal. -many you will see in my demonstration what this means. We've almost finished the theory. Okay, so the last part of theory is that working with DAC, data analysis expressions is the language for modeling. It allows us to add calculations to the model. It is also the query language for Power BI models. 
there are a number of functions that work with relationships. Related, related table, use relationship, cross filter, treat as, and there's a whole family of path functions. Let me speak about the path functions now because I won't demonstrate them. But if you have a recursive relationship on a table, a good example would be our employee table. It has a unique column of the employee ID, but it also has a column of your boss's employee ID. Right? So every employee relates to another record in the same table. We can generate a very special type of hierarchy based on a self-referencing. What type of hierarchy is that? Special name, parent child. Now, a parent child hierarchy is special because we don't know how many levels it will have. It is the data in the table that determines the number of levels in the hierarchy. And Power BI models don't like this. Every hierarchy in Power BI is fixed level. Parent child is dynamic, driven by the data and the relationships between. Okay, so what this means is the path functions are there to help you take the parent child relationship and make it fixed level. I won't demonstrate this tonight, but if you have that type of data, like employees and bosses, general ledger, sometimes is parent child, bill of materials, manufacturing can be parent child then you must use these functions to help you produce columns, and then you can produce a fixed level hierarchy. All right, so that is enough of the theory. I'm going to demonstrate almost everything that I've just talked about, and I'll remind you about strong and weak, that part of the demo. Are we then ready to create a good model, not a bad model? I'm going to go ahead and create a new Power BI desktop file. <coughs> As that's opening up, here's my sales data. The sales data for this demonstration is stored in an Excel workbook. All right, very simple. Every row has an order date, shipment date, the SKU, do we know what SKU stands for? Keeping unit. It is the unique identifier for our product. We see the manager first name and manager last name. This is the manager that is responsible for the sale. And then we see the quantity, we see the price of what was sold. So we're going to model this tonight. Here I am in Power BI Desktop, and the very first thing that I do, and this is my recommendation. Always, when you start a new model, what should you do first? Any recommendations on what we should do first? Import, no, not yet, not ready to import yet. There is the temptation. With some patience and some good guidance, I would recommend the first thing you do is save. Okay, and I'm going to save this as good demo. Why do I suggest that you save? Because you know what happens? Somebody comes and says, Peter, can you come here for five minutes? I have a question. And I come back, what am I doing? What was I doing? Oh, I was doing the good demo. Okay, so you can always remind yourself about what your project is. What is the number two thing that I should do? Get data. Mm. I'm not ready to get data. There is one more recommendation that I have for you tonight. File, option settings. Make sure the options are good for your project. Now, I appreciate that you work in the Turkish Power BI. Okay. Does anyone work in the English version of Power BI Desktop? Okay. Ah, I'm surprised. What's that? Show me by hand. That's close to half of you. Why is that? Is it because documentation is in English? Now? Okay, no, I'm really surprised by that. All right, well, 
thank you for those people that don't work in the English version. I will do my best to explain things. Okay, what matters is down here under the current file for loading data. And I'm pointing out here that there are in fact some options about relationships. The defaults are actually good. What they say is that as you import data, it will automatically detect relationships and add them for you. Tonight, I'm going to turn that automatic behavior off because it's not good for education reasons. When things happen automatically, you, you just expect it to happen. We are going to think and create every relationship <laughs> manually instead. Now, there's another property in here that has nothing to do with relationships, but I hate this property. Does anyone know which one I'm about to turn off? Yeah, why do you think I hate this? Losing the size of the data. So in fact, what will happen every time you import a column of data type date, it will add a hidden table to provide year, quarter, month, and day values. So the reason that I hate it is that I would prefer to create my own date table and control the way that date works for me. And there might be some date columns that I do not want it to do this for. All right. So I turn this off as well. In fact, my recommendation is that you turn it off at global level. You never have to worry about it again. That's a personal choice. I'll tell you that in Australia, the government and most companies their financial year begins on July 1. The auto date table says that quarter one is January, February, March. So it doesn't make sense for most of the Australian companies and my customers. Okay, but that is distracting from what matters tonight. I have just turned off the auto relationship section to see in demonstration otherwise. Okay, let's go ahead and bring in the sales data from this Excel workbook. All right, so I connect to the workbook. Power BI says to me that there are different sorts of data. There's actually a table in here, which is my sale table. I'm going to import from it. What do we do? Do we load or do we transform the data? Why do we transform it? Thank you. You see, if you click load, it loads every column, every row. If you have large volumes of data, this is not efficient. You should be carefully considering exactly what do I want to load. So by clicking the second button, it opens the Power Query Editor, and I have good control about what I'm doing, what transformations, if necessary, I'm applying. So there's my order date, my ship date, my stock keeping unit, first name, last name, quantity, sale price. I detect that I want a new column that will multiply quantity by price. So I add a column that is the multiplication, and this will be renamed as my sale now. This.
Uh, yes, but I'll have to. Okay, apologies for that break. Okay. Connected. You to do online participant. I can continue now. Okay, one last thing I need to do is Okay, where were we? 
God, we had a streaming audience and the streaming cut out. So I've just joined a meeting and I think we're back online. I've added the very first query. It brought in the Excel data as is, but multiplied these two columns together. Now things are going to get a little more interesting. So not do I, I want sale, but I need my dimension table. So let me then bring in some additional data. And what I can do is connect to some data that sits also in, uh, in fact, in CSV. And you'll see that my product data is in fact stored in a CSV file. So let me create a second query that connects to the CSV file. And here is the product query. Am I happy with that result? No, why not? Right, so we notice that the first row in fact is the column header row. And so I apply a single transformation, which is let's go ahead and use the first row as header. And there you can see my unique column for stock keeping unit contains unique values for each product. And then I've got product and subcategory information here. Well, what's a little more interesting is that I have some additional data sitting in Excel, which is the subcategory data. So the classification of a subcategory into a category is in fact defined here in an Excel workbook. That if it's a cold beverage, then it belongs to the beverages column. So let me bring in this data as well. So now I have three queries. I have sales, and I have product, and I have subcategory. But wait, more. In order to produce discount calculations, I need to know where my list price comes from. So the list price for a product is a different file. And you'll see that for every stock keeping unit, I know what the price of that is. This one in as well. And yet there is more. The manager that is responsible for the sale is stored in a CSV file. And I want you to pay close attention to this manager data. Right, so the first row I'm going to promote and there's just the two managers. What do you notice about this data? <laughs> yeah, there's a subcategory for the manager as well. So we have their first name, their last name, their email address, and subcategory, which is a little bit unusual. Subcategory doesn't belong to manager, it belongs to product. But at this company, the sales performance, the managers are measured by the sales for one or more subcategories of products. So I want you to notice that the second manager has two subcategories, hot beverages and snacks. All right, so what I will do with this data um, is some transformation. In fact, I'm going to rename the query here. This is now the raw data for manager. And then I'm going to create a reference. So I'll create another query by referencing it. And this will become my manager query. What I will do is remove subcategory. Yep. And I also want to know what the full name of the manager is. So I'm going to add, um, <coughs> add a new column. That will merge those two together. This will become my manager column. Okay. So what have I got? A sale query, a product query, a subcategory query, a product list price, a raw manager, and a manager. Now, these queries are just instruction on how to load data into the model. Every query will become a table of the model. There's one query that I do not want to create a table. Raw manager, right. Raw manager is the raw data. So what I will do is right click this query and I'm going to disable the load. That means the query exists. 
but it will not load data into the model. And I want you to notice that raw manager is now italicized. This is a visual indication that that query will not load the model. So now I have one, two, three, four, five queries that will load to the model. So let me come back to Power BI Desktop for my good model, and I will then apply the changes. Let's do that in model view. Here we see for the five queries, the data being imported to the model, creating the tables and columns. And here is our model. Notice there are no relationships between these tables at this point. Okay, so this is the beginning of my story. Now, what I will do next is make this begin to look like a star schema. What have we got? We've got a manager over here, I've got subcategory here, and product here, and product in this box. So what I want to, you to start imagining is how there's this star relationship going on. This, that's where we're heading with relationship. Now, there is one table that is missing from this design that is critical. Every model should have this table. Date table, when it comes to filtering or grouping by time, years, quarters, months, weeks, days, you need a table in your model that will allow you to do that. At the moment, if we take a close look at sale, we have order date and we have ship date. This is not sufficient for good modeling. So my solution is that I'm going to create here on the modeling ribbon, I'm going to create a calculated table. There's a DAX function that's going to help me, who knows? Date equals calendar auto. So have a look at this function here that returns a table with one column of data and the auto means it will look at all of my date columns. It will determine the earliest and the latest date of each date column and then it will generate rows of data in a new table for me. So let's do this. Um, calendar auto, press enter, and here is my new table of date. Single column date. <coughs> now when I switch back to the modeling view, there is my date table. Okay, but the date table is not very interesting. If it has a single column, that is a unique column for every date, then what I'm going to do is add some calculated columns to it. But year equals this formula here. So take a look at this. CY in English means calendar year. Calendar year and then whatever the year value for the date is. This is a good column for filtering. Filter by calendar year 2019 and give me the sale. Let me add in one more column, which is month. Month equals format the date column as YYYY -Y 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 MM. Then I end up with this type of column, which is very good for filtering and grouping. I could filter by calendar year 2019, I could group by the month, and I could build a column chart of months that. There's one last thing I should do. For every date table, what is that last thing? I should mark it as a date table. Do you see this? I can right click the date table and mark it as a date table. That way Power BI understands that that table it has a special role when it comes to time intelligence. Okay, tonight it won't matter, but not doing a good job as a presenter if I don't tell you these important modeling design concepts. <coughs> All right, so now returning to our diagram, we now have these tables ready for relationships added. How many fact tables do I have? 
which is the fact table. Okay, and the other tables? Dimensions. We filter and group by all of the values in the columns of these tables, all right? So let's do it. Before I create a relationship, this is what you see when it doesn't work. Okay, let me come to the date table and I'm going to build up a table visual that shows me year and the sale amount. Now, when you see a result like this, in fact, let me not use year, that's terrible, let me use month. When you see a result like this, you should be deeply suspicious that something, okay, every month has exactly the same sale amount and the total itself has the same sale amount. Is that possible? Is that possible or that total is just completely wrong? <coughs> well, it is a problem, but I, I'll tell you what, if it depends what the total is doing, the assumption is that it's summing everything. If the total was in fact the min, maximum, technically that's possible. If every month the minimum you sold was 15, 15, 15, then the year minimum is 15. So it is possible, but knowing that that total is sum, that if it was sum, then it should be 15, 12, and that's what we should see. Is this. Well, the problem of course is, as we understand, there is no relationship between the date table and the sale table. That when we're filtering by month, we need that filter to propagate the sale. So let's do this. <laughs> Come back to the diagram. Uh, manage relationships is one way to do it. And then up here, I just manually configure the relationship. Create a relationship between the date table and the sale table. Remember, it's one column date to one column in a different table. It says there's a circular reference going. Okay, well, let's do this. Sale to date. Ignore that. That's actually a bug. Anyway, you'll see that when I've selected those columns, that the cardinality has been set here as one to one. Is that correct? Why not? It should be, it should be one to many. It should be many to one. Because the order date can have duplicates. We can have sales orders on the same day, and yet this is the one side. The cross filter direction, I'm going to switch it to single, but we talk about this later. And now what I do is I click close and look at the way that the visual has updated. The filter propagation is now working as we expect. That when we filter by a month, propagation happens, and we get the correct result now. 15 is the total, and here in the diagram, look what's happened. There is a one-to-many relationship between the two tables. Now, in fact, when you hover over the relationship, I want you to notice that it highlights the columns that are rated. So the modeling diagram is the place to go to to learn about the model relationship. And that we see that the filter direction is one way. Filters applied to date propagate the sale, but not backwards. All right, so now that we've understood the basic, let's start doing this. Uh, I know that subcategory relates to subcategory. So the easy way to create a relationship in the diagram is to drag and drop. Right? And then I've got stock keeping unit to stock keeping unit, stock keeping unit to stock keeping unit. <laughs> And then I come to relate manager and I'm in trouble. Why am I in trouble when I'm relating the manager table to the sale table? Right, what is the rule for a relationship? One column in a table to one column in a different <laughs> table. There is no single column that provides a unique identifier for a manager. And this means you have to do some work. That means in Power BI Desktop, 
that we come to the query editor, what have I got here? I've got manager. How could I solve this problem? All right, so we could combine two columns, assuming that we never have two managers that have the same name. Yeah, so I know in English, John Smith. Very common names, John and Smith, right? So if you then say that we are going to use first name, last name, one day this will cause you a problem. What's the Turkish equivalent of John Smith? Mehmet something? <laughs> All right. So the way that we would solve this without, you know, guessing or, you know, crossing our fingers and hoping that we don't have two managers with the same name is that we can add a column that is an index column. All right. And this is just if I choose from one, one, two, three, four, five, you are guaranteed that this will be unique. In star schema design, what do we call this column? Business key, surrogate key, right. That it's not a real key, but it acts as a unique key for our dimension type table. So look at this, there we have a column named index and there is our unique single column value. Well, let me fix this in a couple of ways. This should be named manager key. And then I would change it to become a whole number. And then I'll also move it down here. What does that mean for the sale table though? The sale table has manager first name and manager last name. It also needs the manager key. This is easily solved. On the home ribbon, I can go ahead and I can merge columns. Oh, what am I looking for? I can combine columns. Here, I can merge queries together. So I'm going to merge the queries, but sale query will merge with manager where, and I'm pressing the control key, pressing the control key. First name, last name matches first name, last name. Now I want you to look very closely at these numbers here telling me the order that they're going to be joined on. So in Power Query, we can merge on multiple columns. Do not confuse this window with the relationship window in Power BI Desktop. They look very similar. This is Power Query, merging two queries together. All right, then I click OK. I expand the manager query to bring in the manager key. There it is. And then I can remove these two columns. So now I have manager key one, one and two. I have now satisfied the rule of a single column to single column. And now I can come back to Power BI Desktop, apply the changes, reload the new table, and there's the manager key, manager key. So I just drag and drop. I create the relationship. Question here. And if there's another John Smith in this same table, if there's another John Smith, okay, well, let's have a look. Then John Smith would turn up as number three. No, no, the, the one with it, it's the same name. The place was the John. Hmm? For example, if we have another Angus McDonald in the same table, but it is not in the uh, delivery Oh yeah, now okay. Yes. So the question was here in our in our source data. The question is, what if we had John Smith or, or a different B John? Yes, okay. it's the same we, name. We are in trouble. And that's a deficiency of the sale data itself. There would be no way to detect that. Okay, so, so we would have to hope that the source system says, you know, sometimes what we say is John, and maybe we use their middle initial, John P. Smith. We would hope that the source system did that. From our side, we can only do what the source data lets us do. Good question. Okay, do we now see the star? No, let's, let's actually, let me do it this way. That's a terrible star, but there it is. <laughs> yes, you can ask a question. Um, why do you have your one to one? Ah, I'm coming there. 
So at the moment I've created the relationships that I've relied on default behavior. When I was dragging and dropping, Power BI will make assumptions based on what it knows. What we're about to learn is that it doesn't always create the right approach. Okay, well, let's see this come to work because here's our sales data. And what I'm going to do is add in a new sales record that on the 4th of the 4th, you know, we sold exactly the same thing that we sold on the 3rd of the 4th. <coughs> and all I need to do is save, come back to Power BI Desktop, and then I say, well, let's go ahead and refresh the sales data. Just import from the source again. And what we see here is actually an error, telling us that the SKU column in the sales table contains duplicate SKU values. Right, well, that's a problem because I would hope in our successful business that we're allowed to say, you know, we're allowed to sell the same product more than once. And the product, uh, the problem, in fact, is this: that if you look at the relationship here between product and uh, and and this is completely wrong, right? So we've got it's not even right. I right click and delete the relationship. This SKU should relate to this SKU. What we see has happened is that this is the one side of the relationship, and this is the one side. Here's the problem, is that when you create relationships in this way, if you look at the sale data, and remember that the refresh failed, so the sale data has unique values in the SKU column. And when you create a relationship through drag drop, it understands that this is a unique column, this is a unique column, one to one. Okay, so be careful with this. If you have no data, or a very little amount of data, it may create the wrong cardinality because it doesn't have enough information. If it knows that the column has distinct values, it will make it a one relationship. We can easily fix this. This relationship here, if you just double click it, I say that this is in fact, what's the correct answer? Right, this is the dimension table, this is the fact table, this is the one side, this is the many side. So the answer is that it's one to many. And then we see this updates in the model. Many side here. So if I go ahead and refresh the cell table this time, not get that error. We now have four rows. All right, so that really reinforces some very important theory. Your fact table should be the many side and all your dimensions should be the one side. We see one exception here in that the product list price, there truly is a one-to-one -one relationship there. For every product that we have, we have a different source that says this is the list price for each of those products. So that is a legitimate one-to-one <coughs> -one relationship. The only other thing that I want to address is this here. That is another default behavior that Power BI does. And I'm just going to switch it to single direction. Talk about this after the break. So important thing now is there's all of the many sides. There's all of the one sides for our dimension table. And we are doing single filter direction. That the filter propagation only happens from the dimension table to the fact table classic design. I would suggest that in your models, this is exclusively what you use, unless you have more complex requirements that we will explore. Yes, question. I also asked when we, when we see in the relationships, all the relationships uh, looking like uh, one way, but why this is two way? Good question. So one-to-one -one relationships are always two-way. Okay. If I attempt to change it, I will get an error because it is one-to-one. -one. And uh, if if we change uh, the one-way relationship two-way for others, uh, what can happen? 
I will come to that after the break. So we will explore that in more detail. But now what I'm showing you is the good design is star schema. Dimension to fact, dimension to fact, dimension to fact. One to many, one to many, one to many. And filter propagation should always be from dimension to fact. We will discuss in more detail why you might change that later. But this is the rock solid theory that we want you to understand for good model design. Okay, so that gets me to a certain point. We're going to be breaking in about five minutes, but let me introduce some functions that work with relationship. All right, so let me start in the sale table. All right, what I'm going to do is use some snippets here. Do this on the sale table. I can use DAX to create a calculated column that does this. Have a look at this. My column says, Go and get the related the category, category, column, and then add that as a column in this table. So what you're seeing is that for S, you know, SKU here, that is a BHB1, its category is beverages. So what the related function does is this. For each row in this table, it goes in the many in the one direction to in a way, look up what the category is. Actually, look up is not the correct concept. These are strong relationships. Remember the table expansion that happened? That table expansion allows it to reach to the one side and retrieve the value. All right, so let's have a look at how that would work. For product that is HB1, it belongs to hot beverages. There's a relationship from subcategory to the category table, and therefore in category, sorry, subcategory, we see that hot beverages category is beverages. So what related is doing is getting the one side value. All right, let's go back to the sales table and have a look at another function. This one's a good one. I'm going to create a column that says what is the discount amount. Have a look at this. The discount for each sale order is go and get the list price for the related product, multiply it by sale quantity, and subtract the sale amount. If there's a difference, then you must have applied a discount. Let's have a look at it from the subcategory table. You know, the related table function allows us to go in the many direction. Go and add a column named order count and count the rows of the related table for sale. This will go in the one to many direction and tell you how many rows there are for each subcategory. All right, so the related function and the related table functions allow navigation across relationships during calculation. Any questions about these? Two of these calculations are stupid. I should not do this. Because that can be done at query time by a visual. Calculated columns increase the size of your model by storing new values. They also slow down data refresh, okay, because calculated columns are computed after the refresh has happened. So this is an unnecessary column. We could easily produce this in a visual. I'm going to delete it. For educational reasons, I've shown it to you. I'll come to your question in a minute. There's one in the sale table that I should get rid of as well, and it's the category. I don't need that to be stored in the fact table. In fact, your fact table should avoid columns that are used for filtering. Right? If we want to group by category, we have the category column in the subcategory table. So I'm going to delete this one as well. Therefore, the only valid one is the discount amount. Do you have a question? Uh, how do you compare calculated columns and measures? So calculated columns and measures are very, very different concepts. Where they are common is they use the same language. What a calculated column does, as I've just done here, it adds a new column to the table 
And for every row in the table, it evaluates and stores value. This happens at data refresh time. Measures are very different. Measures are evaluated at query time, the results are never stored. And they are concerned with summarization. Right? They are formulas on how to produce a summarization over the column. <coughs> right? So they are both defined using DAC. Calculated columns add columns to tables. They allow you to measures that should be used for summarization. Okay. All right, we are almost at break time. But let's just end on one note. One more question? Yes. Okay, the question is when adding a new column to a table, do we use DAX with a calculated column? Or I could come to the query editor and I could add a column here. Both will achieve exactly the same result from the report user. They will not know the difference between where the column came from. So the answer is this it always depends. Usually, the most efficient place to do it is in the editor, okay? Because calculated columns, they're stored less efficiently, they slow down data refresh. But not all calculations can be done in Power Query. Uh, for example, this calculation is dependent on model relationships. Power Query knows nothing about the relationship between so you could probably create this, but it would end up being likely efficient if you have to merge queries and do all sorts of complex things. Whereas once the data is loaded into the model, this is actually a very simple calculation. The answer is it depends. Where you've got choice, I would prefer. Okay, any other questions? All right, before we break. I'm going to introduce that the next interesting thing is this, that um, for our date relationship to sale, we're relating to order date. But what does that mean for ship date? We have two dates here. And so what I'll do is I'll drag ship date and create another relationship. I don't know why it does this, but anyway, it opens the query editor and closes it. But I want you to notice that this relationship is different. The dashed line tells us that the relationship exists, but it is in fact in an active relationship. This relationship is active. Let's break. And then we will talk about inactive relationships and how we will model for them after the break. Can we agree to um, be ready at um, 6.45? Okay, uh, 6.45, buluşuyoruz ve e, sorular gelebilir. Lavabo sorusu gelirse asansörün karşısında tam olarak e, şu direction'da ilerlerseniz göreceksiniz. E, sigara içmek isteyenler içinse asansörlerle en üst kata terasa çıkabilirsiniz. Thank 
to bayan sadar
Okay, are we ready for part two? Things now get much more interesting. We've learned the basics. And the basics are good for most models, but let's consider other advanced concepts. Where I left off was that there are in fact two date columns in the trail table, order date and ship date. I just created a new relationship from ship date, date column of the date table, and we saw that it created a relationship that was inactive. So in fact, the rule is there can only be one active path between two tables. You cannot have different filter propagation happening. It must be one active relationship. If you create multiple relationships between tables, only one can be active. So let's see what this means to this visual here. Okay, what I'll do is increase the font size so it's easy to see. And if I edit the relationships, look at this. Let me make the relationship between order date and date inactive and this one active. Okay, so see that this is where we control the active. I've just switched them around. And then when I click close, we see a different result. This is now ship month, and there's the sales that was shipped. Okay, does that make sense? What would happen then if I create another sale but it did not yet ship. Okay, so this is a realistic situation. The order is created, but next week it will ship. Okay, so let me go ahead and save and refresh the data. Okay, the blank tells us that there is 9.9 .9 did not yet ship. Good to know. Let me switch it back. Okay. Right, now we are seeing the original. Now, the problem we have with inactive relationships, what do you think? You see that I switch it around, then I switch it back again. But what if I want a report that shows me ordered and shipped at the same time? I need the filters to work at the same time this is difficult to do with an active relationship. So the usual recommendation is this. Avoid them. Only use them if you must. What I will do in this demonstration is create a new table. So the question that I have here in the audience, can the users change the active relationship to inactive? No, they cannot. It is a model time design approach. Yet, what we will learn is that DAX formula can change the active versus inactive. But a user still can't do this. You would create a calculation and maybe your users would use the calculation that has the effect of changing the active or inactive flag. You will see in my demo. But the answer is no. Once the model is published, that relationship is active or inactive, that is fixed. Yet a calculation can override this. 
All right, what I'm doing is creating a new table named ship date, and it equals to this my date table. A calculated table named ship date will equal whatever the date table is. My recommendation is that if you do this, you should rename the column. Right? So instead of having a date column, we have a ship date column. Instead of a year column, I have a ship year column, <coughs> and I have a ship month column. Right? Coming back to my model then, look at this. I now have ship date table here. And then I can create a relationship between ship date and ship date. It is an active relationship. Now I have two tables, date, ship date, with active relationships <coughs> to sales. That lets me do something interesting. What's the difference? Uh, data. I'll show you in my demo now. So the, the question I think will be answered by this, let me introduce a column chart where I will put um, I will put ship month, sorry, date month on the axes. I will put ship month on the legend, and then I will put sales amount on the values. Okay, let me order these by month ascending. <coughs> Do you see with the legend here <coughs> that we can see, for example, here in April 2020, I can see that 10 were ordered in April and 10 have not yet shipped. We are we are grouping by month from the date table and grouping by ship month from the ship date table. You cannot do this if the relationship was inactive. You had a single date table with active and inactive, you cannot produce this type of visual. There is something interesting we could do, though, with calculation logic, where we could override this. So I'll remind you that I still have the inactive relationship here. Okay, then what I could do is I could create a measure on the sale table. Remember, a measure is a formula to achieve summarization. And I'm going to use a snippet here that says, copy, paste it, and then we'll look at it together. Calculate. What calculate tells you is that there is going to be a modification to the filter content. Go ahead and produce the sum of sales, but here is the function use relationship. What it says is make the relationship between the date column and the ship date column of the sale table, make it active. Purpose of this, yeah, when this measure is evaluated, ignore the model active. All right, let's see what happens when I add this. And then I can add in the measure to my table using the exact same result because I dragged the wrong thing. Okay, <laughs> looking at that. This one, sales shipped, do you see it is possible in the visual that we could evaluate and measure with different filters? But I want you to understand that that would not let me produce this visual. I still could not filter and group the same visual by using that measure. All right. So the, the thing about inactive relationships here, in star schema design, we call this role-playing dimension. The date, it's sometimes order date, it's sometimes ship date, it's sometimes due date. It can play many different roles. The better approach in Power BI modeling is to take the table and have active relationships. This provides you the most flexibility. Users can filter and group by any of those roles at the same time. One tip when you're doing this is that uh, on our new ship date table, I would come to my properties and I would put a description in here. Use this table to filter sale by ship date. Right? When you use a description on a table, it appears as a tooltip to your users.
right? Because when they're in the field pane, they don't understand the relationships. They do not see the model diagram. They will make assumptions about how filter propagation works, but where you have special behaviors for filter propagation, you should communicate through function properties. Right, how are we going so far? Right. Next. Yeah. Let's pay attention to what's going on here. What does Star Schema Design call this? Mostly. I've been a bit slow. I bought some chocolate from Australia. These are <laughs> caramello koalas. And I meant to give some out earlier. I will be better now. Thank you. <laughs> so, snowflake. Where your dimension has been normalized, this is a snowflake. And there's good debate. Is snowflake good design or bad design? The answer is usually it depends. But in Power BI modeling, what this means is that your product fields are in different tables. Your user that is creating reports would prefer to see all of the product fields in a single table. Is this correct? All right. So let's have a look at how we could improve. This work gets done in the query editor. I come to the product table, and we saw this earlier. I'm going to merge two queries together. Bring in the product, bring in the subcategory where there's a match on subcategory. And then introduce the category column into this table. All right? So even though the data came from an Excel workbook and a CSV file, in the Power Query editor, we can create logic that merge them into a single query and therefore become a single table in the model. What does that mean for the subcategory query? Right click, disable the load. It will not load it to the model. And it says, warning, this will remove a table from your model because it's already been loaded. OK, not a problem. We accept that warning. So let me switch back down here and apply those changes. Watch what happens here. We now have a single table where we have category as a column of that table. To me, that's an improvement. Just because your source data doesn't present it that way doesn't mean you have to model it that way. Where possible, consolidate the same subject or same dimension into a single table. There is another benefit for doing this, and that is to create a hierarchy. If I right-click category, I can create a hierarchy that I will name products. And I'm going to add the level of category and product. It is not possible to create a hierarchy when category belongs to a different table. Hierarchies must be based on the columns in the same table. Hierarchies are great because users learn how to navigate from category to subcategory to product. You don't have to have hierarchies, by the way. You can manually add the levels to a visual. That just takes time. And users may not understand that that hierarchy exists if you don't create it for them. All right. The next improvement is what about list price? Having this one-to-one <coughs> -one relationship here. I would argue that that's also a property of the product itself. Right? So in fact, one-to-one -one relationships, I would try to avoid them at all. There's clearly a direct relationship between them, so let's merge also the product list price. If the SKU matches the SKU, introduce the list price here, and then we will disable this query. So really, our three product tables become one. Certainly for one-to-one, -one, I would suggest you don't use relationships, like don't do one-to-one -one relationships. 
go to the query editor and actually bring them into a single table. Okay, that will have a side effect, by the way. Just broken our formula. So it pays not to be building calculations until your model design is we can fix this because we now know it's the product table. Okay, so generally speaking, avoid one-to-one -one model relationship. In the query editor, merge the two together. Okay, any questions so far? Right, well, let's make things a little more interesting. Here we have good star schema design. No snowflake anymore. But there's a new timer. Uh, we need to bring in sale target. What are the sales we want to achieve? So let's take a look at the sale target data. New data source coming from Excel. We have, oh, it's CSV, my mistake. We have sale target data. So have a look at the data. By month and by subcategory, what is the quantity? All right. I'm just going to import this in immediately. I want you to notice that month has been converted to a date type. The category is text. Then we have whole number for the table is loaded for the month. And we can see that it relates to subcategory in product and date. Date goes to month. It's a one to many relationship. There's unique dates here and there will be repeat but then we've got a problem because subcategory, relating to subcategory, there's no what happened. Relate subcategory to subcategory. And Power BI comes back and says, you can do this, but this cardinality is many to many because I cannot detect that there are unique values in either column. Okay. Well, from a filter direction, I'm still going to change this. I want a filter that, that filters on product will filter sale target, but I don't want this one here. We'll come to the discussion about bi-directional filters shortly. So I'm just going to make it single direction, and I'm going to make the relationship active, and now we have a many-to-many -many relationship in the model. Relationship between product and sale target is many, many, because neither column contains unique values. <coughs> this is the technique that you will use when a dimension table is relating to a fact table, and the fact table is at a higher level of granularity than the dimension table. The dimension table is at product level. Our targets are at sub Category level. So a many to many can help. There's a different type of many to many we'll talk about in a minute, where the dimensions are many to many. This is a fact table at a higher level of granularity, dimension table. Now, the warning, and I don't like this warning, but I'm working on it. Warning, not very helpful. Now, click on this link. Uh, I get an article here that talks about many-to-many -many relationships, but it really doesn't tell me what the problem is. Come back in a couple of weeks and we will have fixed it. The problem is this. Let me demonstrate with a report. What I'm going to do on a report page is I'm going to show you month, I'm going to show you product subcategory, and I'm going to show you quantity and target quantity. Sure, is that, does that need to be larger? Maybe. So we can all see it clearly. 
There's absolutely nothing wrong with this. All right, when I'm filtering by hot beverages, it just works. I'll show you when it doesn't work. But what I'm doing is I'm going to create another copy of this. Control C, Control V. Here is another copy of the same visual. And I'm going to modify it so it doesn't use subcategory anymore, it uses product. Do you see a problem with Right, the problem is that the sale target knows nothing about this. We're, we're choosing in this visual to group by product, which is at a lower granularity than the fact table itself. Right, so in fact, if I remove sale quantity, we end up with some rather strange results. Look, cookies 310, popcorn. That's not actually true. The subcategory of um, snacks is 310. And you have this problem that if you're going to use a many-to-many -many for the higher level fact granularity, but you're going to use the dimension at a lower level, it doesn't make sense. Right? So you want to be very careful. It is misinterpreting the data. What you could do is solve this with a calculation. Look at this. I will produce a measure. Let me add it, and then I will show it to you. What I'm doing here is I've got a measure that tests. What the measure does is this. If the product column is not in scope, you can sum the target quantity together. But if it is in scope, return blank. You can control that if they're doing something, like using a low-level granularity against a many-to-many, -many, you can return blank to save seeing something that could be confusing. This is what the warning is telling us. If you're going to use many-to-many, -many, be careful of its behavior. And using product, sale target knows nothing about it. Any questions? All right, we move into the other type of many-to-many. -many. That's many-to-many -many cardinality of a relationship. But do you remember our managers have a relationship to subcategory? And in fact, one of the managers had a relationship to two of the subcategories. This is the next type of many-to-many -many we talk about. Right? So the many-to-many -many is that we have managers and we have subcategories. And a manager can have many subcategories, and a subcategory can have many managers. There's a many to many between the two dimensions. This is different to the many to many cardinality product to sale target. Beginners, I can understand this is confusing. All right, so let's go ahead and model how this works. Well, before I start it, Let's now introduce the topic of bidirectional relationship. What does it mean to allow relationships to go in both directions? This is how you can see that the relationship filters in both directions. What that means is that if I filter this year, by year 2019, it will filter here and it will filter here. If we filter product by category hot beverages, it will filter target, and it will filter date, and it will filter sale. This is not a good thing to do. I will tell you when it is a good thing. But the problem with bidirectional filtering is very inefficient. Power BI has to work much harder 
at propagating filters, so reports can be slower. And it can produce some undesirable behavior. So we see customers doing this. For example, if we filter by category, only show me the dates where that category was sold. You might have a slicer. And then the users filter by a category and then the slicer keeps changing. It removes or adds different dates. It's because of the bi-directional filtering. And some people like this. I only want to filter by dates, the categories that I'm filtering by. But our experience tells us that this is confusing and users don't understand why the filter options keep changing on them. Usually a better idea not to do it. Efficient, confusing for people. When do we do bi-directional is where I head now. There is a specific circumstance where we want you to use it. But let me do one more thing here. Let me make this relationship bi-directional. Okay. Let me make this one bi-directional. And Power BI says no. When you start introducing bi-directional relationships, you create circular references. This is not allowed. Those relationships cannot continue indefinitely, right? So you'll find the other problem with bi-directional is that you will end up with a problem where the model will not do it. So I'm going to remove them all. We have no bi-directional relationship, and I'm going to teach you now the only time we want you to use it. It's why Microsoft added it to Power BI. This is to do with our many-to-many -many relationship between managers and subcategories. So let's come back to the raw manager data. Remember that each manager is assigned to one or more subcategories. I'm going to create a new query. I'm going to reference raw manager and create a query that is called manager subcategory. Right, the first thing that I need to do is merge the manager query because I need manager key. Right, first name, last name, relate to first name, last name, and give me manager key. And then get rid of these three columns so that I just have these two, manager key and the subcategories. That are How am I going to work with this concept here? Power BI doesn't like that. In relationships, it wants exact matches. We need to split this out into one row, subcategory. And this is the power of Power Query, right? This is what I can do. I can say, right click this column, split the column based on a delimiter. The delimiter is a semicolon, and do it for every occurrence of that semicolon. That's what it does. It would create as many columns as it needs to to split that out. And then I would right click the manager key and say, Unpivot all other columns. We end up with this. And then I can remove the attribute column. I can rename this as subcategory. There is my relationship between a manager and a subcategory. Noticing that manager <coughs> key two has two subcategories. Do we have a unique column? table. We don't. Right? And this table is really a mapping. For each manager, what subcategory do they report to? In Star Schema Design, what do we call this table? <laughs> no, it's not a junk dimension. Is it a dimension table or a fact table? It's a fact table. Who said it? It's a factless fact table. 
<laughs> so it is not a dimension table. It is actually a fact table, but it doesn't have any columns that we would like quantity or sale amount. All right, so what I'm going to do is load this to the model. And there is our relationship between, there we go, there's manager and manager subcategory. How do we create the relationship to support this? Well, manager key to manager key. But subcategory to subcategory, we could do this as a many to many. Or to show you a different technique, I'm going to add a new table called distinct subcategory. Subcategory. Uh, so we end up with a table that looks like this. Whatever the distinct values in the subcategory column of the product table are, create a new table based on them. The reason that I've done this is now what I can do is this. Subcategory to subcategory is a many to one. Subcategory to subcategory is a one to many. And then manager to manager key is a many. I'm using one to many strong relationship model based on. But let me go ahead and put this to the I'm going to create a, a report here that says for the manager, what are your sales? What are your sales? For Angus, he has 30.8. Let's understand, we are grouping by this column. What is happening with the relationships to allow summing this column? Well, filter propagation says that manager is propagating the sales. Therefore, filter the sales by the manager, sum of sales amount. Look at this. It is not going this way because this relationship is not propagating. It is filtering this table, but it is not filtering the other tables. It's not here and it's not here. This propagates. But here's the thing. Manager is really a role-playing dimension. There is the manager that made the sale, and there is the manager that we want to um, determine their but manager means a different thing, doesn't it? Manager who made the sale, or according to the subcategories that they are related to, what are the sales of the subcategories for those managers? What if we want it to go this way? If I make this relationship bidirectional, what does that mean? Look at this. If we filter by manager, we can propagate here. It propagates to here and here and to product and to sale. That would be ambiguous. Remember that active versus inactive, they cannot be ambiguous. When we look at the model diagram here, it looks like it's going in both ways. Internally, Power BI would not let you do that. In fact, Power BI Desktop should not let you do that. But because this is, a, this is one hop, this is one, two, three, four, internally, Power BI says, I take the cheapest route. I am going to take the single hop propagation. I will not do the four hop propagation. Okay? But what if we did this? What if I made this relationship inactive? Let's see what happens. I come here, and the relationship between manager and sales here, 
I make it inactive, it is now taking the other path. What we now see is that Angus has five, and remember, Angus only had one subtype. B had both subcategories. <coughs> so she gets to see all sales amounts. Now understand that it is now propagating filters here, here, here. We shouldn't rely on this. This is a, not a good design. So I'm going to make this active again. And I'm going to think about how we could make managers work. So I would propose that we would delete this. There's two ways we could solve this. Uh, I could use a calculation that we I'll come to the sale table. I'm going to add a measure that says sales before equal. We go calculate the sum of sales amount. Here is the cross filter function that says the relationship between manager and sale is set to none. You can actually turn off the filtering completely. And my mistake, I should not have deleted it yet. Put that back where it was. So we can, through a measure, force it to use a different path. We have two possible filter propagation paths, and this is the Or the other approach is I delete this relationship. And then I modify my sale performance. Look at this. Calculate the sum of sales amount. And here's a different function, treat as. The filters that are being applied on the manager table, put them on the manager subcategory table. That you can virtually move the filter that's being applied to one table and through a calculation, push those same filters. Right. What that means is this. We now get the correct result. Because what the calculation is doing is this. The filter that is on manager, filtering by Angus. Angus is manager key number one. Push that filter to here and filter this by manager key one. And then it will use this propagation to produce but also what I needed to do was to turn off. Not only am I pushing the filters on manager to a different table, but I'm turning the filter off between manager and sale table. So as a modeler, my lesson here is you control the table the relationships and the property. And calculations at times can choose to overplay the same. There's no exact way to do this. Know what you can do. How are we doing? So there were two things here, many to many relationships between manager and subcategory, is that you have two dimensions that are related. We have to introduce a factless cash table. Manager key, subcategory, and we have many to one and many to one. One of those relationships has to be bidirectional. This one here has to be bidirectional. If it wasn't, the filter on manager would not propagate to here. This is perhaps the only time we want you to use bidirectional filters is to resolve a many to many. Awesome. Well, that brings the model design to almost um, the next thing that I would consider is this, that you do not want certain columns and tables to be visible to your users. Columns and tables that support relationships probably shouldn't be used in reporting. So let's do this. 
um, this table and this table <coughs> should be hidden. Uh, columns used in relationships, like manager key is a surrogate key. So what I'm doing is I'm multi-selecting columns. And what else do we have? Order date and shift date and stock keeping unit. And then I go ahead and I hide all of them. So what that means in our report view is that we have this nice, clean list of tables that are either dimensions or facts. We use the dimension tables for filtering and grouping, and we use our fact tables for summarization. That is a strong pattern we want to adopt. Every table you add to the model, is it a dimension table for filtering? Therefore, give it a unique column. Fact table, have the corresponding column, one to many, and use it only for summarization. I make the column that shows a piece. And this, I think, might be considered to be an improvement of this. Of course, it has more complexity to it. Shift date, sale target with different granularity, any to many between managers and subcategories. There's a couple of other points. How are we going? 15 more minutes, have you got it? To give you a complete coverage, there's a couple of other things. Um, let's do some theory. That was good modeling. So good design practices in the presentation that I'll let you download. A lot of the good lessons are here. So strive to follow. Start. Think about your tables being dimensions. Act. Try not to make a table be both at the same time. So that really means don't put columns in fact tables. You use the factor. Wherever there's a rule, sometimes there's a reason to break. I don't mean never, but only exceptional circumstances. An example in the sale table might be the order number. To create a dimension table for a single column, when you need a column to relate to anyway, there's an example where I would break the rule. I, I don't want a dimension table that has a single column, say column to relate. Learn about star schema concepts like surrogate keys, like the manager key for snowflake dimensions like subcategory to product. You can do them, but generally, in a Power BI model, we consolidate. Role playing dimension, date and ship date. And manager was a role playing dimension, whether it's the manager for the sale or the manager for the subcategory sale. Generally, do not have inactive relationships. Junk dimensions came up. You can use junk dimensions as well. We didn't cover that, but that's just a one dimension. Uh, measures and factless fact tables we saw tonight as well. Table consolidation is a good practice. Try to have as few tables as possible. It will create a better experience. Get hierarchy, category space. Right, so for this reason, avoid creating one to one relationships. Pre-consolidate in the power query. Active versus inactive relationships. Avoid inactive relationships. It makes your model less flexible. Do not have a problem with creating duplicate tables, like date and ship. Generally, your dimension tables are small. So creating copies of them not a problem. But fact tables, we don't want to create copies of them because they many to many relationships. Well, there are in fact two types of many relationships. There was the dimension to fact relationship, where the relationship to the fact table was at a higher level than the dimension table itself. Our sale target example, where we had to create a many to many relationship. And, and we've got to be careful here. It's a many-to-many -many cardinality of the relationship if there is no unique column. 
Whereas the second approach is that we're relating two dimensions together, our managed dimension and our sub and our product dimension for a many to many arrangement. We use a new cashless cash payment. We create many to one relationships, make one of them bi-directional to allow the filter propagation to happen. Bidirectional filtering, generally don't use it. Use it only many to many dimensions of dimension. If you do create one to one relationships, they will always be bidirectional. All right, a quick discussion on data integrity. Remember the sale issue here where we had a blank ship date? That's actually not a data integrity problem. But what if I did this? I create a product that doesn't exist. But on the many side, I'm using a value that is one side. Right, so we come back, I save that change, and come back to page one here, and then I refresh the sale data. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll bring in a category slicer. That blank represents where you have an integrity issue. There it is. So generally speaking, on the many side, you should not have a value that is not on the one. It suggests there's a problem with your data, or there's a okay. Now here is the issue. If it's a strong relationship, table expansion will give you the draw. If it's a weak relationship, it is eliminated and very careful with data integrity issues and weak relationships. That means many to many, and that means relationship in a composite model between support and direct query resources. That's why we talk about strong versus weak. Strong will give you the blank, tell you that there's a problem, you really should fix it. Okay, there's the discussion on data integrity. A discussion on direct query models. So when it comes to relationships in direct query, who's using direct query? Two or three or four people. So to be clear, everything I did tonight was an import model. The data was literally imported from source system and stored inside the model, and it's hosted in the Power BI service. In direct query, the data stays in the source system. You build a model on top, when we query the model, Power BI queries the underlying data source. The two main reasons for using direct query, who can tell me? Two main reasons for direct query instead of import. Strategy keeps the issue. Data integrity keeps the data integrity issue. Strategy keeps the problem issue. Terrible shot, sorry. So there are limitations on the amount of data you can import. Who knows what the limit of the, uh, what's the maximum size of the model? Um, well, really, there's, there's a, you, you should say to me, Peter, are we working on a premium capacity or a shared capacity? Because it depends. If you're on shared capacity because you don't have a premium subscription and your workspace is on shared capacity, that means literally in a Microsoft data center, you're using a computer that other Microsoft customers are sharing the resources of. If it's shared, what's the answer? Maximum model size? One gigabyte. If you're in premium, you can grow it beyond 13, 15. I think today it's actually 13 gigabytes in size. Now that is still a very large model, but if you have massive amounts of data, then you can't physically import it, therefore direct query is the right mode to use. Leave the data there, and every time Power BI needs data, it queries the source. The second time to use direct query? Exactly, oh, sorry, I'm a terrible aim. I would normally do this, but it's dangerous, and I'm not sure Microsoft have insurance to cover your health. <laughs> or I have insurance. 
So real time, the problem with importing data is that the data is only as current as the last refresh that's happened. In shared capacity, you can schedule eight times a day. In premium, you can schedule much more frequently, but still, if your data is very volatile, changing, 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 direct query is a good choice. You will always get latest data that's there. So if you're going to build a direct query model for these good reasons, the relationship story is almost identical. There is an extra property available to you that says, is the relationship to assume that referential integrity is in place? But if you have that one-to-many relationship, is there guaranteed on the one side that there is a, a, a value? Why would we turn that on? What does that tell us about our data source? Oh, by the way, direct query is so much. You can't integrate data. It is a single database direct query model. What it tells us is that we have foreign key constraints, that integrity is guaranteed in the database. Therefore, you should tick the box that says assume referential integrity, which means direct query will use inner join, not left join. Right? The inner join is actually faster and more efficient. So if you know there's referential integrity, the difference in direct query is you tell the relationship to use this property. Um, there's actually another, I didn't update it. There's a special DAX function called find values. And what it allows you to do that in your, in your direct query source, it might be that it's multi-column relationship. Okay, that in the relationship between a table is actually two column to column. Now I taught you tonight, the Power BI is one column to one column, but in direct query, it will support relationship. But there's a trick. There's a DAX function called find value. You create a calculated column in your model in both tables, find value. You create a single column relationship that direct query knows the source query, join on multiple columns. Okay, so direct query has two different possibilities. Assume referential integrity and multi-column <coughs> relation. Composite models come next, and it's where we finish tonight's discussion. We have import models, we have direct query models, the composite to have both. So there's two scenarios. I have import data and I have direct query in the same model. Or I have direct query and a different direct query. Okay, apart from performance issues, composite modeling is very interesting, but it's very powerful, but also very problematic. Weak relationships come into composite modeling. But if you're creating a relationship between two tables, this is an import table, this is direct query table, it will always be weak. Even if it's one to many, it will be weak. So if you have data integrity issues that the direct query source and the import source has a product key that doesn't have a product key, it will eliminate it from your query result and it can produce misleading. Right? So if you're going to use a posit, work very hard at ensuring you have good integrity across the system okay? because of weak relationships. Relationships within the modes are strong across them is good. That is pretty much all there is to know. There's one very last topic that I'll end up with. It's just a quick demo. But has anybody worked with the body of parameter? Tried to. Tried to. Okay. So what if in English it just means I want to test scenario. You know, what if the Turkish lira and the US dollar, the, the price change. So what we could do is this. Um, there's our sales information. And I can create a what if parameter that says, what is the exchange rate between the US dollar and the Turkish lira? What is it today? 5.7, okay. So let's assume that it can any, be anywhere between five and seven. 
with increments of 0 0.1, and we will default at 5.7. Okay, so anywhere between 5 and 7, 0.1 increment, 5.7, always, and it has to be decimal, <laughs> or fixed decimal. Now, what this does, it actually creates a table in your model. Okay, so let's ignore the slicer for the moment. Here we see a new table called FXUSD Gawai. Do you see the DAX expression generates the table for you? The DAX function that just generates automatically. You could do this in Power Query as well. And so now we end up with a new table that has all of these possible exchange rates. It does this too. It created a measure. It says, what is the value that the user has selected? So what we can do with that is I can create a measure in my sales table. Um, blah, blah, blah. Sales. New measure. <coughs> it doesn't want to let me create a new measure. OK, new measure. So we would say sales try equals divide sum of sale amount by our measure see this measure here whatever the value is that the user is filtering And then we'll format that. Uh, I don't know. Do we have general currency? Uh, ah, this one here. Now what I could do is come to this visual here and say, let's go and add in sales in era. And up here, I can change what I think the exchange is. Right. Why does this matter for relationships? This table is what we call disconnected. It will never filter propagate to other tables. It's While almost every table in your model should be related, here's an exception to the rule. But in what if analysis, the purpose of this table is for the entry, then to choose a single value that a calculation can then use. It does not filter the for the other. That's the note that I'll end on. So at that rate, you've pretty much seen everything that you can do with Power BI relationships. This presentation is available for you download. Um, I've got marketing slides in here, but I'm not going to go through the training, so don't worry about it. Um, what you've got are a number of resources. You can download this entire presentation as a PDF, and all of that guidance and recommendations is included in the presentation. And that pretty much brings the uh, session this evening to an end. Are there any final questions? I'm happy to take them. <coughs> Otherwise, I'll hand off to wrapping up. Thank you really much for this great session, Peter. Uh, is there any question regarding session or any other? For next meetup, what is your recommendation topic? Maybe I can ask for that. What do you want to see in our next meet meetup? A square. Okay. Huh? You answer some questions before. Uh, okay. I know. I'm sorry. I'm a terrible thrower, but you'd answer the question. No, it was for you because you'd answered okay. something earlier. Thank you. Good topic. Thank you. We have a small gift <laughs> for Peter at the end of the session. <laughs>
Oh, really? That's beautiful. Oh, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for coming. You're welcome. Thank you again. <laughs> Herkese teşekkürler. Sizlere de thank you for coming. <gülüyor> Bir sonraki meetup'ta görüşmek üzere. Takipte kalın. Oh yeah, you're welcome. Enjoy. Thanks guys.